Yeah, neighborhood council meetings were always in really god awful places. Um, Can you name some? Well, uh, where were the meetings held for um, to save the? the Oh, to save the ambassador. Well, you know, at the time, at this, at the time when that was going on, it was mostly in the LA um, Unified. The, um, uh, they were the school board meetings. Okay. Yeah, um, and then there might have been a few city council meetings, but I remember waiting online to like say my three minutes piece. Um, and also, you know, honestly, um, I had written to quite a number of historians at that time who I knew. Um, George Sanchez and Greg Heiss and Bill Deverall and a number of other people to see if they might be willing to come to a meeting and speak. Um, and um, even people like George Sanchez, who did not support the Conservancy's efforts, um, you know, had interesting things to say. Everyone, George was really the only one of that group from USC who didn't support it. And I actually, you know, I have to admit, I think I, I probably. Um, Probably disagree with him in some in How some ways. Um, he he felt that the, it needed to be a school for the children in the area, and that it was a black and white issue. Um, and I think I saw more. You know, he's probably right. You know, I was seeing more possibilities, and he probably, from experience, knows that there aren't always um, possibilities, um, and that you know if preservationists had their way, they would turn it into, you know, rehabilitation oftentimes mean gen means gentrification or the displacement of the people who were there before. Um, and, you know, I, I actually think cities need to step in to keep that from happening, though I'm not clear on the policies and, and ordinances and ways that that might happen. So that, that is actually something I'm, I, I, you know, I'd like to figure out a little bit more, I mean, in terms of you know, I, I'm interested in revisiting what happened at the ambassador mostly um, because I do think that having material artifacts remain in place is a significant way for people to also become attached. I just haven't figured out how to articulate that in clear ways. Um, in other words, you know, when you have waves of population, when you have um, the population or residents of an area change, um, what becomes their claim to that space and um, doesn't that increase, like wouldn't that be enriching and don't the more impoverished second wave of people who have been living there, right, after you know the rich have left, so there's a new crowd of people, in this case, you know, the folks who left, you know, um, you know, also, you know, removed a certain tax base, right, and so it seems to me that folks who are less enfranchised or have less money have should have even more rights to have a rich heritage and history, you know, remaining. It seems like you know that poverty either means that buildings are left abandoned until rich folks come along and restore them and then kick those folks out, or the buildings are removed entirely for stuff that doesn't necessarily have a longer sense of connection to the larger history of the region, and that you know those you know less enfranchised folks should have just as many rights to a richer sense of connection to the past. One further complicating it is that it's a closed campus. Yeah, exactly. I was saying that before. It's like you, it's not really open to the people, all the people in the area, um, and. You know, it'd be interesting. <coughs> it'd be interesting to see in the in this current era of school depopulation that there aren't enough children to actually fill the schools that have been built. Um, to see how that campus is faring, um, and to see how its model is faring, because what happened is they had an architectural scheme for a mega campus, and that was 15 years old. The model is for small clusters instead and so they in midstream I think they they set out to change that and I actually haven't been on campus I've been around the parameters and it still does sort of cut the neighborhood off and I don't know that I mean I think historically the site is more utilized than the way the press had been painting it at the time as a place for elites I think a lot of people visited there to do, you know, like why shouldn't you go someplace glamorous to get your hair cut or to send your mail or to go shopping? 
And, you know, I talked to enough people of different ethnicities and economic backgrounds who did go there to think that maybe there's more to it than just like that it was a site where a lot of fancy people got to go and spend the night, which they did. Um, there's no question about that. Um, you know, and certainly people who had weddings there, because when I was working at the Conservancy, we had a portion of the um, web presence for the project that was for people to share their memories, and it's, it was very difficult to get people to send those in, and when they did, they were generally people who were already affiliated with either the Conservancy or with issues to do with um, preservation, right? And so it's a, it's a pretty, it's an, it, it, it skews to be an older um, demographic. Um, and so that demographic, and you know, an older demographic with more money, um, and no kids, or kids out of the house. Um, uh, so you know, so like I'm an older demographic, but I have kids still in the house. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, <laughs> um, but so that demographic would come back. We had some really fantastic stories about people's weddings there, um, and you know, those are those are really great. You know, but. And they are, you know, they they weren't necessarily celebrities, but they probably had enough means to hold a fancy wedding, um, which is beyond the reach of, you know, so many others. So, you know, it was not a representative sampling of the people who visited there. Um, but I would, it would be interesting to try and get a more representative sampling of the people who visited there to see, you know, like anecdotally, I know people, you know, went there who weren't of means 